periodic trends, electron affinity, and electronegativity. After this video, you should be able to rank the atoms in order of electron affinity and electronegativity. You should be able to explain what electron affinity and electronegativity are, explain the similarities and differences behind them, explain why the trends are like they are, and that's very important. Make sure that you can understand the reasoning behind the trends, because what this is going to allow you to do is make sure that you remember any of the exceptions that we're going to talk about here as well. Let's start with electron affinity. This is the tendency of an atom to gain an electron, thereby becoming an anion or a negative ion. Things to be careful to note are that this is an individual atom, not an atom in a bond, and it is becoming a negative ion. This is going to be quite different from what we see when we get to electronegativity. Before continuing, let's consider why an atom would gain an electron more easily than another atom, and then we'll talk about what this does to the trends. What is the charge of an electron? It's negative, so a negative electron must be attracted to what? The nucleus, of course. Now, what trend have we already discussed that describes the amount of charge that valence electrons feel from the nucleus? So I'll repeat that one more time. What trend have we already discussed that describes the amount of charge that valence electrons feel from the nucleus? It's effective nuclear charge. And so this trend is going to be related to effective nuclear charge. The higher the effective nuclear charge, the more pull a nearby electron feels and the more likely it is to be attracted to the atom, or the higher the electron affinity. Now let's see what that means for the trend. The basic trend here is the same as for ionization energy and effective nuclear charge, and for the same reason. The effective nuclear charge increases as you go across the periodic table, and so the likelihood of an atom being able to collect another electron is higher. When you go down the periodic table, the electrons are further away, and there's more shielding. This makes the atom less likely to be able to get another electron since it is further from the nucleus and there is more shielding. There is something that you need to notice though. Look at the exceptions. Notice our second column here and our group right here. And it's hard to see, but your noble gases as well, if you can look through the other columns. These have a very low electron affinity, and that means they don't want to gain an electron. Why might this be? What's special about these groups as compared to the other groups? The noble gases is probably your best chance of figuring this out if you don't already know. So think about the noble gases. Why don't they want another electron? So these exceptions happen when an atom already has a stable electron configuration, which we know the noble gases have. This also will occur if the subshell is completely filled, as is with group two. All of these have the electron configuration S2. The S orbital is filled. This also happens if you have a half-filled shell. So for instance, with our group around nitrogen, these would have S, 2, P, 3. And this P3 is a half-filled shell, making it more stable. So in summary, the trend for electron affinity is that it increases up and to the right. But whenever an atom has a stable electron configuration, it is often an exception. I also want to point out where I got this graph from. I made it through a Web Elements website. If you're a very visual learner, I would highly suggest visiting the site and playing around with it a bit for all of the different periodic trends. Now let's do some practice. For this, you should have a periodic table in front of you and work through it with me using the periodic table. So rank these terms in increasing electron affinity. So find Na, 
find AL, and find CL minus. You'll see these are all in the same row on the periodic table. So that means we can follow the trend. Something to make sure to check for is if you have anything that's extra stable, anything that has a full shell, a half filled shell, or half filled P or D shell, I should say, or a noble gas. And we don't here. And so we're just gonna follow the trend. So this goes from right to left. Now, notice I didn't ask why, I just asked you to rank them. And so we can just say that it follows the trend. If I asked you why, you would need to discuss the fact that chlorine has a much higher effective nuclear charge than aluminum or sodium. So let's rank this. Sodium is furthest to the left. And since sodium is furthest to the left, it's the lowest. This is followed by aluminum and then chlorine, which is furthest to the right. So we can follow the horizontal trend as is. As it goes from right to left, it increases. Now let's look at carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. We need to pay attention to something here, and that's this nitrogen. This nitrogen has a stable shell. The nitrogen has a S2P3, and this makes it stable. So because of that, it's going to have, it's going to be an exception. Normally we would expect this to follow the trend and go carbon and then nitrogen and then oxygen. However, because of this exception, nitrogen is actually going to be lower than carbon. And so nitrogen goes before carbon and then oxygen. The carbon oxygen trend stays the same. This is because of effective nuclear charge. But this nitrogen is because of the electron configuration. Now let's talk about something that we already sort of know, but talk about it in a slightly different way and relate it to electron affinity. So I ask you, why do group 7A, your halogens, form stable atomic anions, aka minus one ions, then you, and how does this relate to the electron affinities in group 6A and 8A? Your halogens, though in the middle of group 6A and 8A, have a higher electron affinity than both. Why is that? Let's start by looking at some individual elements from each of these. So we'll start with our group 7A and we'll pick one. Let's pick fluorine since it's the simplest. We'll write the electron configuration for fluorine. And we'll see that this is 2P5, one short of a full octet. So if we write our negative one ion ion, now we have 2P6. We have that nice, stable electron configuration. Remember that a high effective nuclear charge and a high electron affinity means that something is very likely to gain an electron. So one more electron is gonna fill this shell. It's gonna add stability. And our fluorine is all the way to the right on the periodic table, meaning that it has a very high effective nuclear charge. So because of this high effective nuclear charge and this added stability from the electron, group 7A likes to form negative one ions. Now let's look at our 6A and our 8A elements. We'll pick the ones around fluorine just for easy comparison. So we'll start with oxygen and neon. You may wanna take a moment here to actually write the electron configurations of these two by yourself for extra practice. So for our oxygen, we have 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. Notice that we don't have any added stability here. For our 8a, we have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and we do have added stability here. So our 7a, remember, we always wanna keep our mind on what we're trying to answer here. And we're trying to say, why does our group 7a have a higher electron affinity than both 6a and 8a? And this is because 
of the, what we mentioned up here, that it's related to two different things. It's related to both the high effective nuclear charge and the electron configuration. Electron affinity relies on both of these. And so it has a higher effective nuclear charge than oxygen, but it has a less stable electron configuration than neon, putting it smack dab in the center of the two. From the periodic table standpoint, but from the electron affinity standpoint, it's going to be higher than both of these because it has both a higher effective nuclear charge and an unstable electron configuration. So now let's move on to electronegativity, and we'll see why I wanted to talk about these in the same video. Electronegativity is not the same thing as electron affinity, though it has some similarities. While electron affinity is an atom attracting an electron to become an anion, electron affinity is on its own. Electronegativity is different from that because it is attracting electron density within a bond. So an atom is in a bond with another atom, and it is the amount of electron density that is attracted toward it rather than a whole nother electron. So an atom with a high electronegativity won't become an anion or take on an entire electron. But if the bonded atom has a lower electronegativity than the atom with a higher electronegativity, then it will take on an unfair portion of the electron density. So once again, electron, electronegativity occurs when two atoms are in a bond together, and it discusses how much an atom within the bond is willing to pull the electron density toward it as opposed to toward the other atom. As with electron affinity though, this trend has to do with effective nuclear charge. The higher the effective nuclear charge, the lower the shielding, and the more electron density an atom will draw towards it. So therefore, electronegativity is going to increase as you go to the right and as you go up the periodic table. And the reason for this is the exact same reason as we talked about for electron affinity. The higher effective nuclear charge causes the horizontal trend. The vertical trend is caused by the increasing radii in the shielding as you go down the table, leading to decreasing electronegativity as more energy shells are added. Let's do some practice. For the first one, I just picked three that go across the periodic table. Now notice, because electronegativity is in a bond, they already have a stable electron configuration, and there aren't nearly as many ex exceptions. So when we look at boron, carbon, and nitrogen, we don't have to worry about the electron configurations. We can just talk about the horizontal trend. Remember that the horizontal trend is caused by effective nuclear charge. As we go to the right, the effective nuclear charge increases, which increases the amount of draw that the nucleus has on the electrons around it, and increases the electronegativity. And so boron, being farthest to our left, will have our lowest, and then carbon, and then nitrogen. Now let's look at our next one. Take a moment and find these on the periodic table before continuing. Notice these are not in the same row or the same group, but that's okay because they're gonna follow the trend in the same direction. So as you go up and to the right, your electronegativity increases. Which one of these is furthest up and to the right? Well, fluorine is, and so fluorine is gonna be our largest. And then meanwhile, our furthest down on the periodic table and our furthest to the left is barium. And because of this, our barium is going to be our lowest, and then phosphorus, and then fluorine. While electronegativity may sound similar to electron affinity, you need to be careful not to mix them up. You'll notice that the trend for both are the same. The difference is that electronegativity is the ability of an atom to attract electron density within a bond. Meanwhile, electron affinity is the ability of the atom to attract electron and electron and become a negative ion. 
One occurs in a bond, one occurs on its own. The nice part about electronegativity is that unlike electron affinity, there aren't very many exceptions. Let's think about why that would be. Both electronegativity and electron affinity's trends are in the same directions, and for the same reason. The horizontal trend is caused by an increasing effective nuclear charge as you go to the right, and the vertical trend is caused by increased distance and increased shielding as we go down the periodic table, adding more energy shells. However, when we discussed electron affinity, what did the exceptions come from? They came from our electron configurations, right? They came when we had half or fully filled subshells. This isn't an issue with electronegativity because the atoms are already in a bond. They are already forming stable electron configurations. So if we look at something like CO2, all of these atoms are in stable electron configurations because they are in a bond. They have an octet, they are happy. And so the only effect is that oxygen has a much higher effective nuclear charge, causing it to have a much higher electronegativity. Meanwhile, something like chlorine on its own doesn't have a stable electron configuration because it isn't in a bond. And so when we're talking about electron affinity, we need to talk about electron configurations as well. When we're talking about electronegativity, they're already in a stable electron configuration and we don't need to worry about this. Now that you've watched this video, you should be able to explain the trends for electron affinity and electronegativity, as well as explaining the cause of the trend. You should be able to rank the atoms in order of electronegativity and electron affinity and explain the difference between the two concepts, as well as why there is a difference behind these concepts, why electron affinity would have a lot of exceptions where electronegativity wouldn't, and what are the similarities and differences behind each.